Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming down today. I'm just going to briefly introduce what we're going to be talking about on the panel this afternoon, and uh, then each of our panelists individually, and then they will uh, lead out with their own presentations. Uh, we're talking today generally about uh, archiving and publishing, whether or not there is a potential collapse between these two categories uh, with new media archiving practices, specifically as we transition from the space of the page and the traditional library-oriented archive towards the network and the screen. Uh, so we're talking about intellectual discourse specifically, uh, primarily from the art world, but also reaching into other areas, not just independent visual art, but also uh, networked practices, creative practices in general. So we'll be questioning shared knowledge, uh, the, stat uh, the public status of the archive, how authority functions there, whether or not this is a totally open realm, and how copyright and uh, legal aspects function in this regard. Our first panelist today, John Cates, is here from Chicago, where he is an assistant professor in the Department of Film, Video, and New Media at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He is an artist and researcher in new media art who has written for Further Field, Rhizome, and many other venues. Uh, he is best known for founding the Phil Morton Memorial Research Archive in 2007, which he will be speaking about today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Phil Morton is a very important new media artist who was active during the 1970s and founded the Video Data Bank in Chicago and was known for advocating uh, uh, this idea of copy at right, which is a very important creative idea that has grown into the open source and free culture movements today. Our second panelist will be Phoebe Wong, who is here uh, from Shenzhen in Hong Kong, who is the director of research at uh, the Asia Art Archive. She has taken responsibility there for the research grants as well as specific research projects like Archiving the Contemporary, the International Biennale Guideline Project, uh, Materials of the Future, their most recent uh, historical archive. And we'll be speaking today about participatory self-archiving and also the status of the independent archive like AAA, uh, particularly how that works with rhetorics of institutional critique that have emerged throughout the last 30 to 40 years. Our final panelist, Zhang Weimin, is here from Shanghai. He is a designer and artist, best known for founding DDM Warehouse in 2000, which is probably the only independent art space left in Shanghai. Uh, recently in 2007, he also founded Artlink Art, which is a database that collects images, text, and listings of all manner of exhibitions, artists, uh, scholarly criticism, which has become a very important resource for those of us doing research on Chinese contemporary art. And he'll be speaking today about the connectivity of art facts and the idea of organic institutional collaboration and in bringing art towards a platform of sharing. And all these topics are very important to me specifically because I've been working on a project uh, called Shareism with Isaac Mao in Shanghai where we're looking at how to expand uh, creative output within the, the hyper-capitalist creative world of Shanghai and, and Beijing specifically in a way that makes sense uh, that can be both open and competitive. So I hope we will gain some interesting solutions and new problems perhaps for those questions today. Thank you and please welcome John Cates. Uh, this is uh, the Phil Morton Memorial Research Archive uh, blog that uh, was mentioned earlier that I started back in 2007. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk too much about information which you can very easily read in the uh, brochures that you have. And so I see many of you have the brochures and they look very nice. So I won't reiterate the material that's in there. But rather, I've been um, thinking and feeling through my own research in the context of the conversations that is this Wikitopia Tiny Fest. Um, I'm sincerely thankful for the opportunity to do this thinking and feeling over the last uh, day and today. Um, and in specific, would like to thank Alvis and everyone here who's working to make this conference possible. Um, as well as all my fellow presenters, and you're going to hear, I think, some ideas reiterated from uh, previous presentations and maybe slightly different versions of, of, uh, of those ideas. So, collaborative futures, um, the tiny fest that we're here for, um, collaborative pasts, collaborative presence, perhaps, collaborative histories, and specifically alternative media art histories of collaboration, uh, and specifically a, a one uh, particular perspective, my own, of a collaborative history from Chicago. So that is actually where I'm from. I uh, 
have, I, made a, I made a picture for you. Okay, this is the picture I made for you. And you'll notice that it's, it says, I love Chicago. <laughs> that's true. That's, that's, that's not a lie. I do. I love Chicago. So did this person. Um, this is a kind of stylized image of Phil Morton um, from the, uh, the, the person uh, that the Phil Morton Memorial Research Archive uh, takes, takes the name from. Um, what was also very interesting about Robin's introduction is uh, he was very generous in his uh, explanation of, of who Phil Morton is, but um, he, he may have made you feel bad if you don't know Phil Morton's name. Um, but it's okay, you shouldn't feel bad actually, because uh, most people don't know Phil Morton's name. Um, this actually constitutes a rather alternative media art history, a rather repressed and, through my own work, recovered uh, media art history that has been uh, diminished uh, for various reasons, which I'll go into uh, perhaps maybe in the question and answer, but not so much right now. Okay, let me move forward. Okay, this early uh, media art history, uh, this, this moment in time, and here I, there's going to be some moments in time which are depicted, pixelated, uh, diminished in terms of their resolution, but still translated to us across this time travel back into the early 1970s, into the mid-1980s uh, of Chicago. Uh, this early media art community in Chicago was, as Hector said yesterday, uh, a kind of networked gift economy facilitated by academia and open source slash free culture. Um, it was in this community of endless circulation of a specific system. The system that was endlessly circulated was first transmitted past Dan Sandine to Phil Morton. Uh, the system in particular is called a Sandine image processor. It is uh, basically what we would today call open source hardware. It was a modular video synthesizer which could be reconfigured into multiple configurations. It had a base configuration, which was the classic traditional setup, but then, of course, it could be reconfigured. It could be uh, extended, modified, and then any of those extensions and modifications would go back to the original developer, Dan Sandine, and Phil Morton, the person who authored the manual for creating new image processors. And they would enfold the new changes that uh, were developed by people outside of themselves uh, into this core document, which we would today call the source code, uh, but which they called the distribution religion. So this distribution religion was filled with the symbolic capital of uh, giving and making gifts in the form of shared and shareable media art. This social economy had definitely an emphasis on giving. To again, go back to the, the talk that Hector gave yesterday. Uh, these were artists and academics, and as Dan Sandin said, they were paid by the state to create and disseminate knowledge. So they took that uh, as a kind of ethical position. Um, Phil Morton and his collaborator, Jane Beter, they have also functioned uh, in what we might refer to as the cowboy nomad adventurer. Uh, they would travel out into the uh, mythological American West every summer and collect material, which they would then return back to Chicago, which has very cold winters. And they would kind of keep themselves warm by image processing the materials that they uh, acquired while they were on their adventures out west. That's Jane Beter seated there. And behind the other person, yes, there's in the cowboy hat is Phil Morton. Okay. Nomad, cowboys, adventurers. Also, institutional academics who had some level of privilege and comfort, or as Wendy said earlier, contentment, and uh, were enclosed within specific institutions. Those institutions were the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where Phil Morton founded the video area, and the uh, University of Illinois at Chicago, where Dan Sandin founded what is today called the New Media Department. The image processor was, again, as I said, a, a type of what we would now refer to as open source hardware. It predates this taxonomy, however. It predates the language of, of FLOSS, of free, liberate, open source software. But it did function as a platform in the same sense uh, as many of the uh, projects that Ignacio spoke about yesterday, in which the, uh, the platform is used for the production and for the dissemination um, and for the exchange of the material which is being um, translated and transactionally exchanged in this gift economy. 
So again, this is pre-digital. It's from the late analog era, and it's art making as gift giving. So I find many connections here with contemporary new media art. Also, um, they would have been identifiable, uh, the projects that they were working on then would have been identifiable as new media art now, um, but at the time, of course, it predates that taxonomy. I'm also very happy that um, I don't have to keep track of how much time I'm talking, but that somebody else is doing that for me. So how's it going? Fantastic. Okay, I'm halfway through. Um, so, the image processor was a patch programmable analog computer optimized for video processing and synthesis. And the distribution religion, again, was the manual by which people would make copies of this hardware. And copying was at the core of the ethical position that was necessary in order for people to work with this system. Here you're seeing some images which have been image processed and they're, of course, very low resolution, highly pixelated. Um, they weren't at the time. At the time they were beautiful, luscious, flowing analog images, but I've just downloaded a quick low res version uh, to show you today. So this is what bound this group together, and I think as Kika suggested yesterday, this binding may also have been influenced by the relative geophysical isolation uh, of Chicago. Um, within the United States at the time uh, which I'm talking about, Chicago still enjoyed a famously second city status to New York City, Los Angeles, and even in some cases San Francisco. And for those of you that are counting, that would be fourth city status, actually, rather than second city status. But in any case, um, as Dan Sandine and Jane Beter both expressed in interviews that I did with them, uh, this non-central position in terms of the most often NY-centric or New York-centric accounts of United States media art histories um, itself does account for their ability to have an alternative and experimental practice because they were operating outside of kind of the intensity of commercial pressures. They were also operating under very countercultural ideas. So Phil Morton's idea of uh, copy it right actually um, spans an entire set of practices all the way from what we would now identify as free, libre, open source, uh, or free culture, all the way to pro-piracy. So there's really uh, quite a, a great range. And some of this range contradicts itself, but Phil Morton wasn't very concerned with um, not contradicting himself. Another reason why these may be lesser known uh, histories um, is that they included a kind of radicality of form. Uh, by the people that were working. This is Dan Sandine, and he's working there with the Sandine image processor. Um, so a kind of radicality of form. Um, in particular, they were making collaborative projects that would now, 30 years later, be easily identified as process-based real-time audio-video performances. They would be identified as conversational, perhaps even relational. Um, they would certainly be identified as remixological, um, mashups of video art subgenres, um, but at the time they were very difficult to identify. Um, Christine Tamblin is someone uh, who was a student of Phil Morton's, and she has written uh, about this actually that this may be one of the reasons why people don't uh, know his name. Okay, and Michael Century has also written about this community, and he states that it's probably also the countercultural status of the theory practices that the community was working with that also um, affected you know, their, their potential uh, inability to have been included in what is starting to become canonical media art histories. So uh, yeah, in observing ambivalences and ambiguities as both Wendy and Hector did so artfully in their talks, I would like to note that these artists were um, again radical in terms of their form very experimental in terms of their social relations that they were working with. However, they were academics, they were institutionalized, they were working within schools, and not only were they working within existing structures, but they were creating new programs. So they were sort of your classic um, uh, academics. They were literally crafting curriculum and crafting programs. Uh, so they not only had institutional alliances, but very extreme contentments or in other words, day jobs. So. 
I'll just go back to the image here that I made for you um, and this quote. So this is the quote that opens the distribution religion, the document which is the um, technical um, specs, the technical source code for creating your own uh, image processor. And as you can see here, uh, the idea of copying that is being positioned is, um, is very ethical. Um, it is, in fact, being positioned as, as good, um, moral, um, valued, very positively valued. So uh, this kind of value um, extended also to the making of the shareable art. Uh, as, as Robin mentioned, Phil Morton founded the Video Data Bank, which at the time in which it was founded was a shareable resource, a, a set of tapes that people had made using the image processor and, and other technologies. And, all, and it was basically just an open box, like literally an open box that people could put tapes into and take tapes out of and constantly be exchanging. Now, it has over time become a very different institution, one of the top three institutions uh, collecting and archiving, not so much archiving, but they're in, in that direction, but collecting and distributing, mostly distributing video art. Um, but at the time when he created it, it was this open box. So you would make work with the image processor, which you could also build yourself, probably you built one yourself, put work into the box, take work out, etc. Okay, so here I want to reiterate that there is this kind of constant use and reuse, um, that there is a kind of faithful uh, practice of copying, and that copying is a form of caring for and distributing media art. And this is what hel uh, holds this closely knit community together. So they're working and laboring together faithfully on the good faith of an openness of copy it right for making and sharing media art. So that one, uh, the faithfulness uh, is also from Jane Beter in an interview that I did with her. She explained to me that copy it right was based on the idea that one would faithfully copy. And to faithfully copy means to make as many copies as possible and to take care of them and to put them out into the world so as many people as possible can also make as many copies as possible, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this brings me to uh, the issue that Wendy raised this morning about, quote, the fear of the use, and I would add, or rather the misuse, um, of your content. So the fear of the misuse of content is at the core of contemporary copyright uh, and intellectual property regimes. Those intellectual property regimes uh, burden people with an undue and paranoid suspicion about the fear of the misuse of their content. Um, scholars, legal scholars, of which I am, I am not a legal scholar, legal scholars uh, such as Deborah Jean Halbert have written very um, compellingly on how this is a disabling uh, fear and paranoia and that it causes great uh, angst and, and is literally um, psychotic uh, when it comes to creative practices and creative communities. So we have to heal ourselves and we have to try to um, uh, not be governed by this kind of um, fear of the misuse of our content. And so this alternative media art history of uh, Phil Morton, Copy It Right, and the early video art moments uh, as it impacted the current new media art moment in Chicago is a model, in some cases, worth discussing. Full of contradiction, but worth discussing.